Let's start with the beginning. Bobby, can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing and your background? No. <laughs> okay. How so, about you, Mark? Can you tell <laughs> it's, too, it's too incriminating, actually. It's, <laughs> exactly. Any lawyers? I, I, I was born and raised in New York City, a place most people know as Hell's Kitchen. Midtown Manhattan, we call it the neighborhood. Eventually, Mark and I and, and Haggis produced a television series called The Black Donnellys, which uh, in many ways is that. Uh, thank you. What you were the one who saw it. it. There it is. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> That's why we went off the air, because no yeah, one else that, saw it. Uh, but thank you very much. It was, a, it was a series that was very close to my heart, because it was much, much about the experiences that I lived through growing up uh, with five brothers in Manhattan uh, and a sister. So um, I grew up three blocks from Broadway, two blocks from the docks, right in the middle of uh, two crazy worlds. Uh, most of my family members are Teamsters. Um, I eventually didn't want to go that way. I started studying acting. 1969, couldn't make a living as an actor, decided to make a living as a writer because I was going to write my own work to star in. <laughs> and then eventually I wouldn't even hire me as an actor. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, but during that process, I, I said, if I'm going to write something, I better learn something about writing. I don't have a formal education. I left school in the ninth grade. So I spent about five years just reading the great literary minds of of uh, anything I could find. I read poetry, I read philosophy, I, I, I read uh, anything I could put my hands on. I read plays, I read screenplays, and I tried to understand what it is uh, about writing that, uh, that makes it work when it works and when it doesn't, why is that? And eventually I started writing plays. 1988, uh, I had a play running in New York City uh, starring Michael Imperioli from uh, The uh, Sopranos. It was Michael's first yeah. play. Uh, there was a uh, producer from Warner Brothers named Norman Twain who saw the play, came backstage, and offered me a job writing a screenplay. Um, seven years later, 1995, I had written another screenplay based on, uh, I, I wrote that, that, that movie for Warner Brothers, wrote, wrote another screenplay, uh, Spec, The Great Successes of My Life I've Never Gotten Paid For. That was one of them. Mark Harris and Paul Haggis read this other screenplay in separate corners of uh, their own lives. Neither knew the other was reading it, and they both went through each other. Mark, I'll let Mark tell you the story. And they said, but this new series they were doing called Easy Streets, we should hire this guy. And it was me. Um, and so from there, I started working in television with Mark and Paul, and eventually worked uh, my way into movies, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> hey, Bobby, let me follow up on something. What was it like, you're very candid about your background, in fact, that you stopped school in ninth grade. What was it like to go from a Teamster family to try to break into the world of acting? What, what motivated you to do that, and how did you get over that divide? Th that's a great question, um, and I'm not so sure that I am over it. You never, you, listen, you can win an Academy Award, but you never, ever let go of the feeling that you're a fraud that you're not anywhere near as good as all of these people say you are. Somebody asked me once, are writers courageous? And I said, writers are courageous in this way. We know what we have to offer isn't enough, but we write it anyway because it's all we have. That makes us courageous. So the answer to you, yeah, thank you. So the answer to your question is you never get over it, but for me it was, you know, it was a little, it was, may have been a little tougher than most because I didn't have an education. I had to go out and educate myself. I remember coming home from bartending at night and my, my daughter would be asleep in the bedroom and I just worked eight hours behind the bar and my, my wife would be asleep and I'd take out my book of Shakespeare or Milton or whoever I was reading at the time and I'd have a dictionary next to me. Walt Whitman, Leaves of Grass. I worked, it took me about a year to work my way through Leaves of Grass and I'd get one line and it'd be three words in that one line that I didn't know so I'd take out the dictionary and I'd look up each word and I wouldn't move on until I understood that line. And then I'd get to the next line, and eventually uh, there would be paragraphs that I understood. Uh, how, who, who has read Leaves of Grass? Okay. You, they, those of you who have read it might remember the line, have you felt so proud to get at the meaning of poems? When I read that line, I felt like, okay, Walt, me and you, baby. <laughs> I got it. I understood. This is what it's about. This is what I gave up not going to school. And so it was exhilarating on one hand. On the other hand, it was tough because I had no you know, formal education. And how did you, can, we have a lot of aspiring filmmakers and filmmakers out here who are saying, how can I get people to take my work seriously? 
given your background or anything, what did you have to do to get people to look at you for the talents that you have, which are immense? Well, that, that's a great question. I can, uh, there, there's no easy answer, guys. First of all, you've got to get people like Mark Harris to read your work. I, as I just said, that's how I broke into television. Mark and Paul read my work. Uh, but there's no easy answer to that question. The, there's, no, there's just no way. There's no, hey, go this way and you become a success. The only thing I would say to any of you is the difference that I think I, that made, that I made in my career was that I refused to let someone else have the decisions and make the choices that were going to dictate my life. When they wouldn't hire me as an actor, I decided to learn to write. When I, you know, when, when I couldn't get people to produce my plays, I produced them myself. I have a friend who's a New York City cop. I went and borrowed $2,000 and did my first production, borrowed money from a New York City cop. You know, um, so I did whatever, I, I scratched and clawed and did whatever I had to do to make sure that I made the decision in my life. Nobody, those of you who are writing out there, those of you who are directing, Here's the one golden truth that you should never lose. Nobody can stop you from writing, from acting, or directing. They can only stop you from getting paid for those things. <laughs> so now the question becomes, what's important to you? Is it important to get paid, or is it important to act, or write, or direct? You have to face that. And once you face that, and I face it in my life, the rest is easy. Wherever it goes, it goes. For me, it was always enough to be in the business. I never knew if I was going to act right or direct. It was enough for me to be delving into this craft for the rest of my life. I, I always, quite frankly, until I was 44 and he hired me, I figured I'd be always tending bar or working in construction to support my family. I, I had another child. I have two kids. Uh, now I have a grandson. I just assumed that would be my life, and I decided it was enough because I was making the choices. Mark, you've been blessed. Um with the good looks and the personality and the social skills. <laughs> well, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself now that you can actually answer a question appropriately? Well, um, I was a poor uh, black orphan child <laughs> <laughs> from Georgia. And, uh, <laughs> and I moved to uh, Brooklyn, um, not too far where Bobby is, because I was afraid of going to go into his neighborhood. Our neighborhood was tough, but his was tougher. So um, I, uh, at 18, um, decided I didn't like the weather in New York, so I came out to Los Angeles. And I looked up two guys I barely knew and became their roommates. And they took me in because they didn't have money to pay the rent. And they were actors, so I said, good, I'll become an actor. So uh, I, like Bobby, found out pretty fast <laughs> I couldn't act. and. Uh, so friends of mine, uh, I was a good athlete, and uh, we used to play softball together, and it was show business kind of people. Uh, one was Jack Nicholson, who wasn't Jack at the time, because this was in 1961. And uh, he uh, and a few others, Bobby Darren, who some of you will remember, um, were, uh, you know, they uh, kind of liked me. I was the young kid, so they said, uh, you'd be a good agent for talent, why don't you do that? And I said, no agent would hire me, I hated them. <laughs> why would I want to do that? But I became one, anyway. So um, I went from representing actors and uh, the, the agency, I could have signed Jack when he did Easy Rider, but <laughs> they didn't think he was gonna be anything. So um, I uh, went to a smaller agency and I built up a reputation and then I um, went into, from actors into writers and directors because I thought it was more interesting and I, through the years I found a young man uh, in about 1976 who was from Canada who wrote a few scripts uh, for television and for films and I said, this guy is schizophrenic, he's so brilliant, his name was Paul Haggis. And uh, so I represented him and, you know, uh, his career started, we started building and, and then um, and how <laughs> it's interesting how we met Bobby because um, at the time of around 1995, um, I was um, representing production companies and packaging. I, I did a uh, package of a series that I had never seen, but I managed to find the funding and the networks to uh, put it on the air, and it was called Baywatch. And, uh, <laughs> So I, w I felt I was pretty good at doing that. And um, so I started 
doing independent financing and movies and what have you as a manager agent. And uh, one of my clients was a company that did One False Move, which was one of the classic independent movies in the 70s, uh, I'm sorry, the 80s. Um, and um, they had some other, you know, independent films and films that I love and they were actually being sold and they asked me to come and be a producer and be a partner and I said, good, I can fail as good as everybody else out there. So I did and the first two movies I did was one called Twilight of the Goals, which was a play and had some really significance about something. I love films like that. And the other was a film called Gods and Monsters that uh, we garnered a lot of awards. <clears throat> so our company started building and I was doing those kind of movies and then Paul uh, Haggis was in television and we sold uh, Easy Streets and uh, we were looking for writers and uh, I was again with this other company called Regent which was my company and I was looking for films as well and I came across this script called One Eye Kings uh, and uh, Paul called me and said, I read this script. Um, he's never done television, uh, but it's really terrific. And he says, I said, what's the title? He said, One Eye Kings. I said, that sounds familiar. Um, no, he says his name is Bobby Moresco. I said, well, that sounds familiar. He said he wrote the script called One Eye Kings. I said, I want to make that film. And he says, hire him. <laughs> so that's how we got to know Bobby. That was 12 years ago. And that started a, a kind of a chain reaction of, of things that we started to do. We, uh, we also developed another thing called uh, Joey Ice Cream, which was going to go on next, but for some reason an actor dropped out. We didn't get to make the pilot. That eventually became the Donnellys, um, which was Bobby's life. And uh, so I started doing that, and you know, then came uh, Million Dollar Baby, which we were kind of like running around trying to sell. And uh, then Paul Haggis and Bobby gave me a 35-page treatment called, it was called something else then, I can't remember. It was Liberty or it was something, it wasn't called Crash. Yeah, it was yeah. called something else. But at uh, any rate, it was for a series. And I said, I don't see it as a series. I think it's a movie. You guys should write that. And Paul wanted a direct, so therefore, that's how the incarnation of that happened. And since then, Bobby and I were on the set of Crash when uh, he was, Bobby would rehearse all the actors. And uh, he would, uh, he came to me one day and he said, uh, uh, Tandy Newton wants to uh, do a play, what should we do? So I said, without even blinking, I said, let's do the black version of uh, uh, Thousand Clowns, which was a classic in 1964, five, and garnered a lot of Academy Awards, but a lot of people's favorite of our age. And he just said, oh my God, that's brilliant, let's do it. So I said, let's also not only do it as a play, let's try to do it as a film. So we started doing that, and uh, we're in the process of getting that made. So um, that's kind of brings me to here. Fantastic. Bobby, what was it like uh, <clears throat> working with Mark the first time, okay, coming in as a, well, a new writer? Well, first of all, it was like home. Mark's from Brooklyn. I'm from Manhattan. You know, uh, we, we, from the beginning, we talked the same language. Um, I was a neophyte. I had never, I literally had never had a job in television. I had no idea what people did in television. All I know is Mark and Paul were producing this show called Easy Streets. Paul said to me at the lunch, after they had the conversation he just told you about, he said, why don't we have lunch? We had lunch. He said, you want to work in television? I said, ah, you know, I never thought about it. I was, I was a playwright. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul said, well, why don't you read the script and uh, tell me what you think? And I read the script and it just blew me away. I said, holy shit. I called him up like a minute later. Yeah, I'll do this. <laughs> and, but they had no sale at the time. It was still a quote unquote blinking green light. In other words, no one was paying the bills and the network was saying maybe we'll do it. So Mark and Paul out of their own pocket opened up production offices, hired a casting director, paid for all of the money. You'll learn, those of you who haven't done it yet, 
things only happen when you take the bull by the horns. Mark and Paul, I told you about what I do, Mark and Paul opened up a production office. They hired a casting director, they brought me in. There was no job yet. A lot of people would say, I'm not gonna lay out my own money. But that's, that's when you're not laying out your own money or you're not laying out your own time, you're not laying out your own effort, nobody else is going to do the same. Nobody else is going to do what they need you to do. So anyway, they did all that. And uh, of course, I'm a young bartender. I'm, uh, I'm working at night bartending and, and I'm going over to the office with Paul and, and Mark from nine to six every day with no salary. But I knew, I mean, I knew how special the writing was. Uh, so after about four weeks of every day in the office, you know, Haggis said to me, go home, you know, just, just, just go home. I said, no, no, I'll, I'll go home when you go home. He took a beat, he said to me, you're making yourself indispensable. <laughs> because you've got to put the effort in. And then eventually the show got picked up and little did I know, I had no idea. By the way, neither one of them has said, ever said to me, what do you want to do on the show? What did I know? You, you, in TV, you start out as a, a PA, a writer's assistant, you get a story editor job, maybe. You get one script, maybe. You get associate producer, maybe. And then suddenly we get the call from the network and Paul and Mark disappear into a room. And Mark walks out and says to me, congratulations, you're a producer on the movie, on the show. So, okay, what else was I going to be? <laughs> <laughs> what, what I didn't know is that Paul and Mark had just catapulted me about six years ahead of everybody else who works in television, but I had no idea at the time. But that's the kind of guys they were, and they made sure because I put my effort in, they rewarded it. So uh, that's, that's what it was like working with Paul and Mark. It was a great, honest collaboration with two guys who, uh, who I felt at home with. Mark, what did you see in Bobby that told you he was a special talent? That he'd work for free. <laughs> <laughs> Besides his good looks? Uh, uh, yes. Um, well, I mean, you know, it, it, how ironic is it that Paul and I separately found this script? I mean, it's like the universe is saying, you've got to hire this guy. I mean, Paul didn't bat an eye once I said, I want to make that film. He said, hire him. <laughs> And we did. We brought him onto the pilot, and uh, as we said, you know, Paul and I put up our own money till we got the, the network to put money. We funded it, and uh, then, you know, we, the network said go, and we started going. We did the pilot, and it's very rare you bring a writer outside the original writer who created the thing into a pilot for a series, because you don't have anything ongoing. It's just a one shot. So. Uh, but Paul wanted Bobby by his side and what have you, and you know they 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 two click. They they're, they're magic together. It's it's so amazing. It's um, to see them you know work together and the many things that uh, we we've done. And you know there are other things that Bobby and Paul have that in television that we're going to recreate and I mean resurface and 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 do to put it on, which they won't show run, but we'll get other showrunners to do. But their scripts are like, they're brilliant. I mean, it's, it's very rare, you know. It's, I, I, I won't go that far saying it's like the Beatles coming together, but you get the point, you know. <laughs> Somebody has said that to us. <laughs> Let me ask you this, Million Dollar Baby and Crash, in my opinion, are two movies that, forgive the pun, pull no punches and go right after the throat of the most fundamental human experiences. I, I felt like I had been TKO'd when I saw both of them. And why don't you tell us a little bit about what it is that motivates you to get involved in projects like that and how you've been able to work on projects that have so much emotional integrity. Oh, God. That's too many questions to try to answer at once. I, I will tell you this. There are two reasons a writer writes. One, because he's got a story in him that he has to say, and nobody can stop it. That was the case with One-Eyed King that Mark and Paul read for me because it was based on my own life, and I said I had lost a brother, and it took me about eight years to deal with the emotion of that and the truth of it. And the only way I was eventually able to deal with this was by telling this story. The other way is people hire you. Okay, and, and people think that you, you, you know, a, a writer should never take a job for money. Well, that's baloney. Okay, if you need a job, it's either bartending, construction, or write. Excuse me, I'm going to write. Having taken the job, though, and it's a little bit opposite of what the question is you're asking me, having taken the job, it is incumbent upon you as the writer to find something thematically, something about the human condition within that storytelling, and then write that. 
Forget why you were hired, forget the movie, it's not important. They expect a certain movie, that's okay. What you have to give them is something from your soul, something that you feel about the human condition that will fit within the story that they've asked you to write. If you don't do that, you're just writing for money. It's a bunch of baloney and everyone will recognize it as such. So with any piece of good storytelling, whether it's Million Dollar Baby Crash or any other things any, that Paul or I or Mark have worked on, if it's not coming from your soul, if it's not something that you care about deeply, immensely, and all importantly, while you're writing it, uh, then it, people will not be touched by it because you weren't. I, you know, it's true. Um, a, a, as I said, I was an agent for writers, directors, and when writers would come to me, even Paul at the time, they would say, what, do you, what should I write? What is the market bearing? What do they want to buy? I said, never go there. Because if you go there, all you're going to do is manufacture something that is not going to be, unless it, it, it comes and it's really from your heart and you really get behind it and you really love it and you really thirst to tell that kind of story. But never, 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 never go down a path what you think somebody would want to buy. Because invariably, I know myself as a producer, when I did some things for money, it turned out caca. And I never would do that again. I'd rather, you know, fortunately I have had some successes in my life. I don't need to take on certain things, but I would rather tend bar than make something that I don't feel really good about for money. So, um, you know, I would urge you out there who are writers or, or anybody, who even producers with projects, you know, find something that you really feel and sing, you know, that you really feel connected to. And that, that you know, enthusiasm sells a lot. As I understand it, Crash came about because Paul Haggis was actually had a carjacking victim and he was inspired to write an outline about that experience. And then you became involved and said, this is a script that will be, never be optioned on a film that will never be made. Why don't you talk to us about what inspired you about that script, that idea, and well, encouraged you to work on that screenplay? Again, it's, you know, it's always about this idea that, that, that won't let go of you and you can't let go of it. Paul was hijacked, much like in uh, Carjack, much like in the film when, uh, when Chris and um, uh, Lorenz take on the navigator from Sandy and Brandon. Paul went to a video store, came out with his wife and heading for the car, and two, one young African-American came up with a gun and stole their wallet and their car and then took the video. They came back for the video. They came back for the video. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and uh, actually, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, when the cops came, they said to Paul, so what happened? He said, I got it all figured out. They've been trying to rent this video. <laughs> for months, and we finally got it. <laughs> and the truth is, when we wrote the script, Paul and I, it was one of the few scripts that we cut, uh, one of the scenes that we cut, we wrote the scene. The next day, the two guys, Chris and Lorenz, are watching the video they stole, and it's this Norwegian piece about a guy in the sea when he just sits there on his boat for the whole movie. <laughs> and what is it with these white people? This is the kind of movie they rent? Uh, I, but, I hated that they cut that out. Yeah, it's, it's a classic piece. It, it, the scene worked wonderfully, but it didn't serve the movie. Eventually, we cut it out. Mark's right. Uh, but anyway, uh, so this, this, this night stuck with Haggis until about 10, 12 years later. I get a, a phone call. A lot of these things would start with a phone call. A lot of these things Mark and I have pulled worked on would start with a phone call from Haggis. Hey, I'm thinking of doing something. What do you think? So he sent me, he said to me, listen, I got these pages I wrote last night. I, I don't know what the hell it is, so, you know. And um, I'm gonna send them over to you. What do you think? You think it's anything that we wanna do? And they, by the way, we're talking about spec here. We, we wrote both Million Dollar Baby and Crash on spec. No one paid us to do it. As I said to you before, uh, the only thing they'll stop you from doing is getting paid. If you wanna write, nobody can stop you from writing. And both Million Dollar Baby and Crash, nobody paid us a nickel. So Haggis sent me these pages and he said, what do you think? And, as Bob just alluded to, I said, you know, nobody's ever going to make this movie. Nobody's ever going to buy it. And if they do buy it, they're never going to make it. But it's a story worth telling, so we should do it. So we went to work. We took those pages that he started with. We created a 35 or a 40-page outline. We thought, we thought it was going to be a mini-series. 
you know, we had no success in film at all at this point. I had written and directed one movie. Paul had written and directed one movie. They both sucked. Nobody ever wanted to hire us again in feature films. So um, we thought, we know television. This is a series. This is a mini-series. This is something. So we wrote these 35 or 40 pages, and we gave them to Mark. Uh, we always gave everything first to Mark. Mark said, you guys are out of your mind. This is not a series. This is a movie. He said, no, no, no. This is a series, Mark. Just don't, just don't be silly. And uh, fortunately, no one would buy it as a series. <laughs> so we had to decide what to do. And if you're going to write something on spec, you're not going to write a series on spec. You're going to write a movie. And Mark got his way. We wrote it as a movie. Uh, and then no one would buy it. And Mark took it out and eventually got somebody to buy it. What I think is amazing about Crash is, is that it's not one story. And there's not a solid through line yet. And I think everybody here would agree the movie just hangs together. What was it that you, that you saw in this script or made you able to sell this project given that the story structure was highly unusual for and, the Hollywood and, and, format? And, and you hit it, that's why. Because it was different. I, have, I had never seen a movie that linked together that kind of thing that had so much to say for me. I mean, this was my feeling. I mean, it was about prejudice for me. And it was about how people are not either black or white. They're gray. And, and, and how we're, you know, we can say we're liberals, we're this, we're that. But we all have prejudices from either from here, from here to here. I mean, so that's what I loved what it said. You know, uh, you know, when they asked, you know, they said to me, can you sell this as a movie? I said, probably not. And, you know, they said, how come? I said, because, A, you've got to understand how movies or independent movies are made. Well, it doesn't matter. Even studio movies are made. You have to have an international appeal. And being this was more urban in Los Angeles, a first-time director, uh, for, for, for the most part, um, it doesn't have any foreign value. So nobody in the international marketplace would say, Oh yeah, we can't wait to do this thing, and they would give you X number of dollars, which, you know, investors, no matter who they are, studios or independent, would look at and say, why would I put up money that no one's going to buy internationally, and depend upon what it's going to do theatrically here? That's crazy. So it, it was a hard road to get into, uh, but yet it, it's interesting. Sometimes you find your angel out there. And that's all we did. It was perseverance. We all loved it, and we kept working and working and working at it. And you know, there were a couple of companies that said yes, but didn't want Paul to direct. And Bobby and I and Paul got up and walked out. That was it. So it took. It actually took about six months of concentration of getting the script out there to find a home. But it took two years after we found a home to really get a go on the project. <laughs> To make a deal, get the cast and everything, and it had six or seven, you know, false starts, and we were going to be canceled, canceled, canceled because we couldn't get a cast. As I understand it, Don Cheadle was wow. instrumental in spearheading the the crusade to get this movie made. What did Don do to help both of you? Um, obviously, his acting talents are indescribable; they're wonderful. But behind the scenes, what, what kind of a factor was, was he? Well, you know, as Mark just alluded to you guys, the way you get an independent film made is you get the actor. They don't buy the script. They don't buy the director. They buy the actors because they can then sell the actors in free sales and guarantee they're going to get their money back. For the most part, that's a simplistic version, but for the most part, that's how it works. So we couldn't get actors to sign on. We couldn't get actors to read it. Actors know their value in the independent world. They know that if they say, I'll do a movie, you're going to then go raise the money on their name. So they're, very, they're loathe to read anything without, a, without a, a, an offer. So to get an actor to read a script with two guys who never made any features and, uh, is just impossible. But anyway, Don eventually read the script, either Mark or, or whomever got him the script. I'm not sure who got him the script. But he said he'll take a meeting with, with me and Haggis, the writers. So we sat down with Don, and finally an actor that might be interested. And Don sat down and he said, I'll do anything you want me to do in this movie. I'll do craft service. <laughs> wow. We said, good, we want you to be a producer. And as well. As well. And <laughs> exactly. And Don said, OK, I'll produce it, but why? We said, because we want your Rolodex. 
<laughs> so Don went out and called every actor he knew. That was his producerial role and worth every inch of it. And now because Don Cheadle, an actor magnet, one of the really fine actors in America, and everybody wants to work with him, now any actor in the world is going to read the script. It's not a, it's not a script coming from Mark Harris, Paul Haggis, or Bobby Moresco. It's a script with Don Cheadle attached. Everybody now wants to read it. And when people read it, they wanted to do it. So without Don, we have no movie. Crash is a terrific film on any measure. What's the resistance in Hollywood to making a film of such quality? Well, the, the truth of the matter is you should ask Mark that, because I never ask myself those questions. I, I just don't deal with them. I don't think Haggis does either. I don't know any good writer that deals with that question. It's not important to us. We need to write the story, the characters, thematically. We need to understand what it is about the human condition that we're writing and trying to explore it, and then we give it to somebody like Mark and say, go get us the money. I never have to deal with that. I really don't. So I, this I got to ask. Well, I, you know, again, I fell in love with it as well because of what it said. And, and they turned the script in in two weeks after we said, let's go make the movie. You know, let's write it as a movie. We, we wrote the script in two weeks. Me and, Adam. And, uh, and that treatment they wrote, 35 pages, was pretty fleshed out. I mean, there is nothing missing except a couple of scenes and, uh, from that treatment that's not in the movie that didn't make the script either. Um, so it, it was really there. And, um, you know, I, I'm an obstinate kind of guy. I'm from Brooklyn. And uh, no one can tell me <laughs> what to do. So uh, they may not give me the money to do it, but I, 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 I'm persistent. Anything I love, eventually I get made. Uh, it may take me 10 years, but, you know, I still stick with it because that's how I am. Um, if I really like something um, or actually love something, um, even though I knew the obstacles about the international market, I was absolutely wrong. I didn't give some of these people in the international marketplace any credibility because their tastes are only based on who's in it and um, how can they sell it. But they read the script and they were, what they do is before a film is made, they will put up money as a pre-buy for their territory, like France or Japan or Spain or whatever. And we were getting offers. Interestingly enough, Japan put up a million dollars as a, a pre-buy on this. I fell over in my chair when I heard that. So sometimes you, you, don't, you, you have something of a gem that, you, that the international marketplace will look at and say, we love this too. And of course, we had Don Cheadle, and we had a couple other actors in at a time. Actually, the actors in at a time did not make the movie because of scheduling, because we said we had so many false starts. Like uh, Heath Ledger was in it uh, for uh, uh, Ryan Phillippe's role. Uh, John Cusack was playing um, um, Matt Dillon's Matt role. Dillon's role. Uh, Eva Mendez. We, Eva Mendez played uh, Jennifer Esposito's role. Um, Forrest Whitaker played. Um, uh, Terrence's. Terrence, Terrence's role. So we had a whole different cast than we came up with. But, so they, they bought it based on some of the people we had, and we didn't have them all at the time, so they, they came at different <coughs> intervals, and we lost them out of their schedules and our schedule. And so you, you have uh, a situation sometimes that is unique. This was very unique. It's, it's not the rule of thumb, believe me, because I'm out there every day trying to get things made with people, and it gets tougher because right now, if we were putting this out right now, we would have such a tough time because the international marketplace is on a whole different level now of why they're not buying dramas, why they're not buying American films. I mean, it goes on and on and on. That's, but that's the, the essence of your answer is exactly that. This is a business, and when people look at a project, they don't look at whether or not it has intrinsic humanistic value. They look at whether or not they're going to get their money back. It's really that simple. I may, I may like the movie, I may not like the movie, but if I put up six million, am I going to get my six million back and then at have least. a shot? Huh? At least. At least. Well, I at least get that. That's the, 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 the overriding concern. So unless people see some intrinsic potential for getting their money back, they're not going to give you the money. They're just not. There are very few angels out there who care only about the craft. And if they are out there, Mark knows them. I don't know them. Um, so there you are. So somehow someone has to see within this thing that you love so much something that they might love too. 
could you talk a little bit about how winning the Academy Award changed your lives and what it's like to get to get projects funded now and how the industry reacts to you now as as to in the past. You know, for the first for the uh, for the first few months, anybody will do anything you want to do. It seems no, no matter what you got an Academy Award, everybody wants to get you on the phone. The big difference is you spend your whole life trying to get what you love made, and then. Nobody will answer your phone call, and finally somebody answers your phone call, and you win a couple of Academy Awards, and now everybody's calling you. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is you'll find that they all want you to write something that you hate. <laughs> I mean, I can't tell you how many ideas and scripts that I got, and I said, this is, this is terrible. This is garbage. You know, this is crazy. Um, and so, I, it, you know, I, I got a couple of movies right away. Um, that really turned my life around. Fina financially, it changes your life. It puts you in another bracket. You know, suddenly, everybody wants to work with you, and people are offering you money, and that never happened to you before, and it's really cool. But for me, there was very few things that I, that I really cared about. Um, so it changes your life financially. I, I, I'd spent my whole life broke, my whole life. Uh, and now I'm only a little less broke. Uh, but no, I, I make a good living now. I, 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 before, when we wrote Crash and the Black Donnellys, I, I had, I had, we made a living in television before that and we left, so I, I had uh, lost my home, couldn't pay the mortgage, uh, was living in a rented house again. I lost two cars that I had, I couldn't pay the cars. Uh, almost claimed bankruptcy. Uh, Paul mortgaged his house. We, we were dead broke. And all of that stopped the minute the Academy Award came, so that, that was nice. I own a house again. <laughs> Um, and two cars. And, and, <laughs> and two cars. Um, so uh, the, the big thing that changes is the money. Suddenly you're getting offers for all kinds of money that you never dreamed possible. Uh, and what I didn't do is I didn't, write, I didn't take one job on something I didn't love, as I talked about before. So I didn't get a lot of big, big money jobs. The jobs that I did love weren't big money jobs, but I was really happy to do them. Um, so it's the money. I mean, here's the thing that doesn't change. You don't become a better writer. When you have an Oscar the next day and you're sitting down to write that next scene, it's not any easier to write. It's just you're still the same writer you were. You're not any better, you're not any worse. You look up at the Oscar, maybe you're a little bit worse because you look at the Oscar, it's on your shelf, and you go, shit, I gotta do that again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you're up back. We didn't write the other stuff and expect that. Now that suddenly it's over your head and it's hanging over you and, and you have to write like an Oscar winning writer and you really gotta get rid of that. You really gotta get rid of it because it's a burden, it's an albatross. And that, creatively, that was the biggest thing, trying to write as an Oscar winner as opposed to just write. And, and because you've got to really write what sucks before you can get to the good stuff. That's, that's what a writer does. You, write, you, know, you learn what, what works by writing all the stuff that doesn't work, and you throw away 90%, you grab that 10% that works, and you start over. Writing is rewriting. When you, when you have an Oscar in the beginning, you think you can't write the stuff that sucks. You have to bring it right away. I have an Oscar. So creatively, it's getting rid of the albatross of having, trying to be good. Because you can't try to be good, you've got to try to write. And monetarily, it changes your life. I'm getting the feeling that the whole monetary thing, it's nice to have a car and to be able to care for your family. But deep down, I have this gut feeling that there's something else that's motivating you. With all of the accolades of every variety that come with success in film, when you look at the battle that you fought to get out of Hell's Kitchen, for Bobby Moresco, what's the payoff for all of this sacrifice? Uh, uh, I don't know. My mom and my dad, you know. Uh, and how about you? How did the um, winning the Oscar uh, affect your ability to get, like you're working on the Black Donnellys, and how did, how did that help? Well, um, based on the fact that Crash was a success and Bobby and Paul had uh, the Black Donnellys, or it was Joey Ice Cream, um, they revived it, and uh, the networks said, we want a series by those two guys on the air. So it became something that was basically handed to us. I mean, so that was a benefit of what Crash you know, did. Uh, I made another film with Aaron Eckhart and Helena Bonham Carter, 
that uh, I walked off of because the director lied to me. And he didn't fulfill what he promised he would do. So um, I took my name off as producer and just got exec producer. And it's playing on cable. And it's, that's why it's playing on cable. Um, but you know, I, I promised myself, and again, I, you know, the albatross is something that I, you know, <laughs> I bear because it, everything that, you know, Bobby and I got four or five projects together and each one is Academy Award kind of movies because we have one with Charlize Theron on Susan McDougall who was the woman in Whitewater uh, who wouldn't, um, you know, s turn the Clintons in because it would be a lie and she went to seven different prisons for contempt of court, and it's, it's a brilliant story. And, um, you know, as I said, we have Thousand Clowns. We have another one that's the Russian Godfather. And we have all kinds of interesting f films that have substance, that have something to say. And, and as I said, it, it gets tougher each year that doing the kind of film crashes the gods and monsters. I'll, I'll still stick with them. It's very tough to get made. And, you know, you've got to find the right angel to make it work because <coughs> you, you, they still won't finance you because of the films. Now, these films, they're in development. Bobby's writing um, this other Russian Godfather. We have another Academy Award winner, David Ward, who wrote this thing. He's going to write it. So, you know, we have different kinds of things and different kinds of incarnations. So we, we went for a much tougher... Uh, kind of which we feel still be, you know, uh, the public will still like and go see it. But it's those kind of movies we, we tend to, uh, are drawn to. So it's, it's, it's tougher. So that, that's where we are. We're on the verge of making a couple, but terrific. You know. Good afternoon. I'm Halfton, the co-founder and director of CineQuest, and I'm very honored to be here. Uh, the maverick spirit of CineQuest represents the 18 years of our film institute the wonderful artists and innovators that have visited us from around the globe, as well as those who have received the award, including Gus Van Sant, John Schlesinger, John Waters, Kevin Spacey, Spike Lee, many amazing artists, many amazing mavericks. Now, where does the word maverick come from? It's derived from Samuel L. Maverick, a rancher back in the 1800s who was the one guy who did not brand his calves. So these people ran free and they ran wild. They were renegades, these calves, and that's where the word maverick came. And I think there have been a lot of people that have grown up in Hell's Kitchen that have been mavericks. Few, though, that have taken that spirit to Hollywood and have really continued to not only express that spirit, but to utilize the system as well as their independence to create great Maverick work. So I, on behalf of the board of CineQuest and all of the artists and innovators that have been here in the past and this year, am very honored to present our Maverick Spirit Award, our highest honor, to Bobby Moresco. Nicer than the Oscar, that's for sure. Uh, I can't thank you enough. Everybody here at CineQuest, thank you. Thank you, Mark, for all of your support. Um, this is, this is exactly. Okay. This, this, this is really special um, on this front. The idea of the Maverick. It's, I, I believe my entire life that you need to go your own way. You need to touch some place in your soul that says, this is me. And no matter what happens in the world, I need to follow that place. I need to follow that place, as Joseph Campbell says. If you trust that in your soul, sometimes things work out. In this case, I can't thank you all enough for saying that things worked out. 